Uh, since everyone's here, we have a good full room. <laughs> um, so let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time to be together and for this weather. We pray that you keep those who are homeless safe and protected. We also thank you for these documents of Vatican II as they guide us and call us to action and to work in the church. We ask this in Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Lord. Okay, so we're going to cover the other documents. So um, it's not that these documents aren't important. It's just they are not... Uh, um, um, the, the the major four, so their decrees and declaration. So I'm gonna try to do this uh, PowerPoint because it keeps me organized. Uh, so there's three dec declarations that came out from the council, and so these are the Latin names: one on Christian education, the relationship between the uh, Christians and I mean the church and non-Christians. And then also religious freedom, which we will spend quite a bit of time on. And then the rest were all uh, decrees, which are a little bit longer than um, declarations. So these are all of them. I just wanted to show you them. Now, um, this next thing is not something I made, but I just found it useful to kind of summarize. So. These are roots. So we've gone over the liturgy, and the liturgy is kind of like roots of the plant. It's what feeds us in the same way the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, is what feeds us spiritually. So that's always the source of the Christian life, also the summit. Well, um, we then have revelation, which is kind of like a stem of a plant, which provides the, the, the structure and the foundation of what our faith is based upon. It's based upon what Christ has revealed. So from the nutrition of the liturgy that gives us grace and from the structure that God has, that God has revealed in divine revelation, um, the church stands upon. So it's kind of like a, a flower. So that's women gentium. So these are kind of the three major documents we've gone over, the liturgy, revelation, and the church. And then Gaudium et Spes, and my battery went out. It's OK. I can just scream. Um, the Gaudium et Spes and the other 14 documents are all kind of like pebbles that make this a flower. So, um, to put it in perspective, we have the liturgy that gives us the nutrition, the divine revelation, which is the stem, lumen gentium, which is the center of the church, and all the other documents kind of pertain to the church and its role with the world and the role with its members within it. So it's just a little visual. I did not make this visual. Um, this came from a professor at UD. Um, and I didn't want to try to think of another one. So here it is, trying to just summarize all the documents as a whole. So we'll be going over the pebbles. We'll be picking one each time. Like, so does he love me? Does he not? Does he love me? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so breaking down the documents, we can break them down into two sections. We can have those that pertain specifically to the church, or Lumen Gentium, and so the one, there's one that focuses on the bishops, on the priests, on the training of priests, on religious life, on the laity, and then on the Eastern churches. So we'll focus on those, and then on those that kind of fall under Gaudium et Spes, the church in the world. So the church missionary acti activity, Christian education, ecumenism, its relationship with non-Christians, 
religious li liberty, and mass media. So the first part, I'm going to focus on the church herself and those documents that pertain to it. And the other one is the church in the world. I might then refer to them in their Latin terms because it would just, I would butcher them and I would just laugh at me. So we won't do that. Save the comedy. Okay? So the, the role of the, the document on the bishops defines what a bishop is. It's the successor of the apostle. The bishops united make the Episcopal College when they're united under the Pope. And the bishops have the authority when in union with the Holy Father. So I want to kind of put this in a diagram. I'm going to try to do this often. And again, so Jesus appointed Peter, our first Pope, to oversee all the apostles, as we all know. And so him, with the apostles, oversaw the church. And this, as we have all heard of apostolic succession, is passed down. So Jesus is the invisible head. The Holy Father is our visible head of the church. And those bishops in union with him whoops, um, have authority. But when a bishop steps outside of union, he lacks that authority. So if he goes against something the church speaks, um, he uh, lacks the authority to speak on behalf of the whole church. Does that make sense? Or in a sense? Um, so that's what makes the, the College of, of, of Bishops. Bishops united under the Pope. They have authority to take basically the universal church's principles and, and bring them down as a, wait, oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So this, this is getting more practical. So the bishop oversees his diocese. His primary role is to govern, sanctify, and teach, to carry on the, the mission of the apostles. And so the bishop has the authority to take the, the universal principles of the church and to apply them to his diocese. So again, to kind of make this an outline, I like to think of like the universal church gives us a fence of like, this is what Christ teaches, and these are the principles of the, of the church, the guidelines. And so a, a bishop has authority to, to, to make these principles his own. And I'll, I'll give you an example as we go on to, with this. So um, Bishop Strickland has the authority to make some slight changes in the diocese as long as it's inside the universal church. So he can move it over here, but he can never, yes, yes. Um, he can never take it outside of the church. So an example would be uh, like in America, you go, I came from the San Antonio Diocese. They confirm at the age of, not really, we don't even have an age. Um, it varied within the diocese. So it could be eighth grade, it could have been a junior. There was no uniformity. But Bishop Curada has the authority to put a, a determination that we're going to confirm and bring it back to the restored order to confirm children before they receive First Eucharist. A bishop has the authority to stay within the universal guidelines of the church. Does that make sense somewhere? So, but the bishop can never say, you know what, we're just going to do a wave of confirmation. That's stepping outside of it. Okay. So, bishops are called to work together, and the document calls primarily through synods and councils. So this is the bishop and the pope working together. So the bishops, like with synods and councils meet, they dialogue, they formulate a document, and the pope oversees it and approves it. So they work together with the pope. 
Um, the document also called for bishops to work together what's called Episcopal Conferences. So a primary example of this would be like the USCCB. So this is just the bishops of the United States coming together and dialoguing. They don't have to go to the Pope and speak to him. And they're trying to cause unity within the diocese, OK? I'm um, trying to make some uh, 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 clarification here um, with these two things, because later on, the, um, the Vatican had to kind of specific, uh, make things specific with these two types of organizations. So we see uh, synods and councils, it says magisterial. This is the church speaking on behalf of its authority. So we must submit our in faith of what the church is saying. But um, with Episcopal councils, when not approved by, by the pope, because it's just, again, the, the College of Bishops is the bishops working in union with the pope. With some of the things of Episcopal conferences, the Pope does not have to approve, and so they're not considered, I put, um, they're not magisterial unless the Vatican approves of it. So I don't want to get too much into uh, um, the specifics here, but uh, the USCC, the USCCB puts out a lot of documents that um, the Vatican does not, approved. They, they, they are there to have our guidance. Now when it comes to like liturgical ma matters such as um, liturgical practices in the, in, in the United States, they have to submit that to the Vatican for approval and then it would become magisterial. So, so an example would be like the, um, the, the, the Vatican gives the U.S the United States bishops an indult to do something, such as like the children's lectionary. The U.S. bishops got together, said we need to form a lectionary for the children. They sent it to the Vatican. The Vatican approved it and gave them a, a, an indult to use it for so long. Um, those would be seen as authoritative, but other documents that don't, uh, have the Vatican uh, approval or just are not seen as a magisterial statement. I don't want to, uh, are there any questions on that or? Um, well, a good example would be like the, um, some of the statements that the, uh, uh, bishops put out recently, I would say, on the, uh, I think they just put one out on the economy and on preaching. Um, they wouldn't hold the authority such as an encyclical or, or things that come from, or an apostolic exhortation, which comes from a synod of bishops and the pope approving on it. So, so there's, a, there's a distinction. In, in the uh, in their statements, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, yes. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. We had the adults. They Ron didn't renew it. No. And and the, and the real reason why I want to specific uh, made this because it may seem as okay. This is just ridiculous. Why would I even bring it up? Because since in America we really don't have this issue, we're we're wondering. But um, right after the council, there was a. Um, a group of, of bishops that put out what was called the Dutch Catechism. And the, the reason why I mean is it was a group of bishops that were not in union with the Pope that put out their own little catechism, which brought about um, the church trying to reform. Um, and it brought up the people of God by Paul VI. Uh, he wrote that document. And then the catechism was put out later in 93 to help clarify and give a, a universal magisterial statement. Like I said, here in the United States, we really don't have that issue, issue but um, it was present in the church. I don't know if I just made that more complicated. I'm sorry. You can kick me in the shin afterwards. <laughs> OK, so we have uh, then the document on priests. So priests are co-workers with the bishops. They have their authority in union with the bishop and the Holy Father. So again, we have Christ, the, the invisible head, the Holy Father, the visible head with, this, with the bishops working to carry out the mission. We then have the, the priests who um, share the bishop's role to, um, in, to govern, sanctify, and um, teach in, the, in their diocese. So we're going to see a priest has authority when in union with the bishops because, again, it's all about being in union with uh, the Holy Father and the bishop. So just because someone is ordained doesn't mean that they have um, authority to become their own pope, in a sense. This is the main thing that I want to stress. Um, so again, just like we had here, we have the universal church, and then we have the diocese of Tyler. The priest has authority to make some adaptation. Again, it's getting smaller and smaller to um, make smaller adaptations. So we have the cathedral within the diocese of Tyler. So Father... McGuffin can't take the, say, well, I want to do this and be disobedient to the bishop. He has to um, adhere to uh, the diocesan policies also. All right, so next, um, the priest is called the holiness. This is just a quick statement of what the document calls them to do. Um, Daily Mass is, is emphasized. It doesn't have to be in front of um, a, congr uh, a congregation for a priest to celebrate Mass. Some people uh, thought that that, was, that came from Vatican II. No, uh, a priest can still celebrate Mass with all the angels and saints present with him. So he's not celebrating in a well. That's a key. Um, so again, uh, Jason spoke up last time about the evangelical councils. We see that kind of as promises of obedience to the bishop. Uh, chastity or celibacy is, is part of the Roman rite. It's not part of the, the nature of a priest, but, but it, um, because Eastern priests uh, can be married, but it's part of the Roman rite, which is uh, required of now, and probably all of us. I don't want to put that. Uh, yeah. There's been nothing that Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, 
the reason why I just made the statement of um, um, the document specifically makes a statement that's not part of the nature of the priesthood, um, and that's do the clarification that a man can only be um, any man. Uh, sorry, I'm going to step back. For the sacrament of ordination to happen, the matter must be a male. The documents have clearly stated that um, Christ only ordained men, and so we can only do what Jesus Christ did. So that is part of the nature of the priesthood. Um, if we have issues with that, we can take them up with God. But it's just something that the church can't do. So, um, but uh, still obviously is not part of that requirement. So that's why the Eastern churches, they, it was um, slightly practiced. They can't be elevated to bishops, but it was never really in the, the steep traditions for priests not to be celibate. It's always been in the tradition of the church, and that's why it will never be changed. Um, and then also the, the spirit of poverty is called for. Now we have the training of, of priests. And I'm going to just slightly go over this just so that you know what our priests actually have to do and, and go through. So that um, so there's two types of uh, formation, there's minor seminary and then major seminary, and then the document spoke, speaks on spiritual, academic, and pastoral tr training. So we have minor seminary, which is usually about two years, and it's mostly focused on really discerning and fostering one's vocation. A lot of times there's spiritual and philosophical studies. Again, a seminary has some leeway, but this is just me trying to explain what many seminarians do uh, and what many priests uh, go through. So there's two years of minor seminary. Sometimes they can even be longer. And then you have major seminary, which is four years, which you receive even more uh, spiritual training, a spiritual directors call for uh, um, so attempt to continue to live out their spiritual requirements, which I mentioned earlier. Academic training, so the church has for a good education before, um, and also philosophy and theology, and then pastoral training, which is the reason why I mentioned this was when going through the document, a lot of times when we hear about pastoral training, we think of, oh, well, how to counsel people, or how to how to deal with issues, which that is some sense, but the document when speaking of pastoral training was speaking, speaks of like administrating the sacraments and catechizing. So the reason why I mention that is a lot of times we need to remember the primary mission is to save souls. And so giving people the sacraments and the teachings of Christ is very uh, essential. Not saying that counseling isn't, but yeah. So then we have religious life. So uh, what is the religious? It's anyone uh, living out the, the evangelical council. So the evangelical council is poverty, obedience, and chastity. So evangelical, the, gospel, the councils from Christ coming from the um, Sermon on the Mountain. So who can live out these? Technically, anyone can be part of the religious life. You have third order, three order Franciscans um, who are laity that can live out the um, religious life. I don't want to go into all the different types and forms because I'll be honest, I get confused. And as you can tell, I would just make you all even more confused. So, but anyone can live out and make a vow to live out these um, councils. So the document also speaks of actual renewal of the religious life. 
So it's not that the church saw, oh, wow, those religious are really slacking. We need to renew them. Um, no, it was just to give some guidelines. One, to try to, to really discern, okay, how as we as this religious um, uh, community, how are we going to live out the Gospels? What was our founder's spirit? So what, what did our founder really want to, to uh, instill the purpose of the order? Um, try to adapt to the church's biblical, liturgical, and dogmatic matters. One of the other ones is how to make it um, live out practically today. So we have a lot of these founders that we're trying to solve. We're responding to issues in the past. So we want to, t they were asking them to look back at their original intent, and then how, do, how would you live out that today to kind of in, in spirit and in excitement, and then most importantly, allow the Holy Spirit to, to work in them. The next one is the laity. So that deals with all of us, except for the broad. So um, we're all lay. Is any baptized Christian who's not ordained or part of the religious state? So what is a, what is a, lay, a lay's vocation? It's a call to the apostolate, which is to continue the, the work of the apostles. So being sent to spread the kingdom of God by teaching, sanctifying, and governing. And now you may think, okay, wait, I thought that's what the bishops were supposed to do, right? Yeah, so why, why would the church mention that? So obviously we, we play in a different role. We cannot administrate the sacraments except for uh, baptism and, and the essential means. But, so how do we teach, sanctify, and govern um, as a way of Jesus? So we're going to kind of go over this. Because this is really the most practical one for uh, us in here. Now I like this quote. Um, Indeed, the organic union of this body and the structure of the members are so compact that the members who fails to make his proper contribution to the development of the church must be said to be useful neither to the church nor to himself. So how about that? So, so that's talking about you. So your contribution, that's coming straight from the document. That's not a, a, a very nice, comforting statement. But it's a good challenge. Like, so how am I contributing to the church? Like, it's not just something that I, I, I join and then I sit. But it's something that um, I get baptized into and then I get confirmed to have the strength to witness. And I'm given the Eucharist to to continue me in that mission to continue the work of the church. So uh, the way he has three purposes, the document states. So one is to evangelize and to sanctify. So how do we, we evangelize the world? Well, Father Brown and Father McLaughlin only have so much time in the day, and they cannot go to everyone's house and every person at the supermarket and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. So who's supposed to do that? Uh, so we evangelize. We go out into the world to bring them back into the church to be sanctified. We play a, a very essential role in bringing members into the church. So a lot of times, that makes us feel incredibly uncomfortable. Like, have you ever thought about, like, have you really ever sat down and evangelized to someone? Like said, hey, you know what? This, this is the good news. I mean, I, I, it's very uncomfortable because our society wants religion to be this integral thing that we don't speak about. So, but that is one of our purposes. Um, would you transform the world? So it did shake a little bit, yes. Um, so we have to play active participation in the world to 
to transform the culture, which as laity, a lot of times we complain, oh, well, the bishops aren't doing this, oh, well, the priests aren't doing this, or no, we're, if we're in charge of transforming the culture, but we all know our culture is horrible right now. So we have a lot to work to do. So that, that can vary in forms of trying to get involved in, in governmental things, but, but primarily in just changing the culture. So it might first start with changing your own culture or changing the culture of your household and changing the culture of your community to be one that is holy. Because, um, yeah. And then acts of charity. Whoops. Oh, man, I'm supposed to save love. Oh, well. Uh, so we're called to help those uh, in the world through actual charitable acts. So primary example that we have a great ministry here would be um, St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, people working together trying to uh, be charitable to those who are in need. Um, yeah. So ways that we carry it out. So the first thing that the church calls is the church community. I'm sorry I, I put this out for, but uh, uh, these are what the church community is speaking of is the actual uh, parish is mostly what the document is speaking of. So these are our communities within the cathedral. So this is Catholic Scripture Society that meets on Tuesdays, the Bible study tools. Um, we just started a marriage and family ministry. And I know that there's a lot more. So if I didn't include something that you're a part of, I apologize. I, mean, I know that we have a visit to the homebound, but the key is, is it's the way to coming together under the union of their, of their pastor. So they're not going out and saying, hey, I want to start my own little thing. I'm going to do whatever I want. OK, no, no it's, it's, it's coming and, and, and seeking the guidance of, of the pastor to carry out the mission of the church. So these are, are a great example. Other ones are the family. So the family is to be a household that, that um, fosters the faith, a culture. So not just teaching um, the faith, but bringing children to the sacrament um, and instilling the faith to them. We also have the teaching of the youth. So we have things such as here, WCC. Um, so we always need great teachers. So if there's anyone out there that wants to be a teacher, come and uh, assist in carrying out your laity's vocation. Um, and then also, whoops, I was supposed to disappear. We have international and also um, things such as St. Vincent de Paul, the Knights of Columbus that work more on a national level. So these are all organizations run by laity, but under the uh, direction of a pastor or bishop because we always need guidance. We just don't start our own thing. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, now the Eastern churches, I'm not really going to go over this. I'm just going to show this, docu this uh, diagram. And this is basically just trying to uh, state all the different rights that are in union with Rome. And so we, we are the Latin right. It's the way that the, the, the right that we express our, our Catholic faith in the liturgy. But we are not the only um, uh, Catholics out there. A lot of times we think that we all celebrate the Mass like we do at the cathedral. But um, there's the Byzantine rite, which has a lot of icons, a lot of uh, iconography comes from the Byzantine. Byzantine liturgy, they, um, they follow the same structure, but they may use a different language and um, 
uh, different dialogue. Uh, there's also the mirror night, right? Which uh, I've been able to go to one mirror night uh, liturgy, one Byzantine liturgy, and the mirror night um, I I enjoy it because um, the Eucharistic prayers in Aramaic, and then they have this uh, neat tradition uh, where when the priest is so is staying the words of consecration, where we as Roman Rite have incense that we incense uh, during the moment of consecration. They use these giant fans as a sign of, uh, of reverence. So it's just different means of when the gospel entered the culture then, how they celebrate the liturgy, and they've, co they've continued that um, means. Uh, are there any questions or okay um sure mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um but 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 the key just on the right um so to understand this is when the apostles went out and they proclaimed, they, they began Christianity in the cultures and began to transform the culture. Christianity took root in that culture. And so that's where we get a lot of these rites from, um, from when the apostles met those cultures. So a lot of times we're like, well, why are we the Roman right? I'm not from Rome. I mean, I'm from America. Why don't we have the American right? We're the Americans. We deserve an American right. Well, no. Um, um, Christianity was was came here in the Roman right. That culture was was put in America. Uh, the apostles really didn't come and and meet the Native Americans at their time. So. We, 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 we don't accept, uh, well, I won't go into that, but yeah. So, so that's why there's not like an American right. Or the Pope, the Pope, yeah. So there's different bishops that, that are sometimes even called patriarchs for them, but, but the Pope is the, the visible union of all the rights. And we're going to kind of go over that later on. OK, so we're done with the church. We're now going to go with the church and the world. Do y'all want to take a break? Or do y'all want to just keep on chugging? Do y'all have any questions? I won't be offended if we stop. <laughs>